Hi everyone, I'm Juliet, and I'm going to spend some time today talking about this moment a hundred years ago that I got really interested in and what it tells us about our political moment right now. So this is a history project from a piece of my dissertation, but I'm not interested in studying history for the sake of itself. I'm interested in what it tells us about our enduring structures and relations of power, what we take for granted as just the way it is, and what alternatives it makes it hard to imagine. A while back, I got really interested in the progressive era around the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And one of the things that was going on was that policing and prisons were facing a crisis of legitimacy. Prisons were brutal, overcrowded, unsanitary. Policing was corrupt and violent, mostly beating confessions out of people. And it was a moment when a widespread push for reform led to an expansion of prison capacities and calls for police departments to become more professional, have better training and technology, etc. So this struck me as an eerie parallel to what's going on right now, where there's massive outbreaks of COVID-19 among incarcerated populations. Places like Santa Rita Jail, just a bit east of where I live, have a number of pending lawsuits for unhygienic, inhumane, and fundamentally brutal treatment. We're seeing uprisings across the country in response to continuing murders by police. And the reforms that keep getting proposed are technocratic or technological fixes. More training or professionalization, expanding the surveillance of ankle monitors, and there's a danger in calls for defunding the police to simply shift funds to another sphere that can play the same role of violent state repression, either more militarized social workers or private security or whatever. So with this eerie parallel, it seemed time to try and get to more of the deeper histories of how these structures were built, the root of what they were intended to do, and the logics that we still take for granted. To think to think through some of these questions, I spent time with the archives and writings of a guy named August Vollmer, known as the father of modern policing. He was massively influential, not only in Berkeley, where he was the first chief of police and founded the first school of criminology at UC Berkeley, but also around the country and internationally, consulting for numerous police departments and governments, founding schools for police across the country and globe, consulting with J. Edgar Hoover on the formation of the FBI, etc., He's generally celebrated as a progressive reformer who cleaned up policing practice, hired some of the first women and African-American police officers, was a member of interracial harmony committees, and so on, which is why I found it interesting when I looked up the proposed curriculum for this first school of criminology at UC Berkeley and ran across, in between lessons of symptoms of poisoning and how to handle firearms, classes on racial types quote, race degeneration, and eugenics as the precursor to units on criminal psychology. If you're not familiar with eugenics, it was a massively popular social movement and academic project based on fakey and now completely disproven racial pseudoscience used as justification for involuntary sterilizations in which California led the nation of immigrants, Native Americans, poor people, disabled people, queers, prisoners, and other undesirables who weren't seen as contributing to the betterment of the race. The pseudoscience studies produced by think tanks and universities work together with the political branch of the eugenics movement and is credited with having inspired the logic and tactics of Nazi Germany. And even though calling this project eugenics became less popular in the U.S. after World War II, a lot of these think tanks just changed their name and kept on rolling and still uh, fund conservative politicians and academics to this day. So it turns out August Vollmer sat on the advisory council for the American Eugenics Society and a number of other committees and societies on euthanasia, what they called mental hygiene, and he was keenly interested in the question of if criminality was inherited, either because of an inferior racial type, inherited disability, or some type of inherited tendency towards poverty, queerness, whatever. Uh, as you see in this quote from Vollmer's book, The Criminal, how to breed a race of superior people was also a part of this question. Uh, 
He was generally obsessed with collecting big data around these questions, uh, wanted to study populations on a whole number of biometric criteria and this connection to criminality. A lot of this echoed the core obsession of the eugenics movement with data collection. After all, the inventor of fingerprinting, Francis Galton, was one of the original eugenicists, and the major eugenicist labs and think tanks were formed for the purposes of gathering biometric and hereditary data on a massive scale, often from schools, juvenile detention homes, and jails, in order to create these pseudo-scientifically based racial hierarchies they were trying to imagine into being. Uh, Vollmer's aspirational horizon was exactly this, a comprehensive knowledge web spanning the academic fields like psychology and sociology, from race and immigration status to biometric data, and connecting it all to a diagnosis and prediction of criminality. While all of this is interesting, I didn't actually care about the question of dragging Vollmer for his fakey race science or rehistoricizing him from good cop to bad cop. Instead, I wanted to know, what does this logic, straight from the father of modern policing, tell us about how our society understands criminality? And how did this get codified into our policing practices and social logic? Did Vollmer see the criminal as born or as made? And how did this influence his theories of the purpose of policing in prisons? What did this mean for his model of social order? And importantly, what did this model of social order require in order to maintain itself? I was honestly confused because on one hand, he thought people were born defective or superior, different categories of human. But on the other hand, he was invested in the idea that these supposedly born criminals had to be reformed through prisoner education. It seemed like a contradiction, right? As I kept reading, I began to realize it wasn't actually a contradiction. I kept running across the idea that reform was possible for some, but there were those who were unreformable that education was possible for some, but there were those who were uneducable. I also began to realize that this whole apparatus, that people could be gathered like data, scientifically measured and objectively sorted according to their normalness, was the old idea of the bell curve. Some people might be familiar with this logic from some racist fools in the 90s who tried to argue for the extremely boneheaded notion that intelligence falls along a bell curve of race. Uh, but I realized through reading that this logic is way older than the 90s and goes all the way back to the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, about when I was reading the work of August Vollmer, and that this logic fundamentally shapes the nature of modern policing. It's organized like this. And this idea does a lot. First of all, it explains the contradiction I was finding in the archives, the eugenic idea that people are born unfit and the push to reform or educate. So there's this tail end of the bell curve of people beyond saving, who in Volmer's archives was the too queer, the disabled, the racialized who don't work and produce for the capitalist order, the labor agitators and anarchists, which Volmer saw as a type of psychopathy, and basically anybody who doesn't conform to the order of the state and who isn't productive to the accumulation of wealth by capitalists. Second of all, it justifies a social order of control because the supposedly superior leading end of the bell curve must continue to reform, educate, control, and police those in the middle who are still redeemable and can still be productive and useful to the social order of racial control and capitalist production. It also hints at, among everything else, the anti-blackness at the core of this logic. Catherine McKittrick talks a lot about this in her work, how black life is absent from the statistical algorithms that we use to organize our world and outside the algorithmic logics altogether, how black life is diselected, selected out in advance and as she puts it, this process is hardened and made objective by mathematical codes. So data gets used to make this bell curve seem natural and objective, like an early version of predictive policing software. Algorithms are, after all, based on their predictability. As McKittrick puts it, they tell us what we already know, but in the future, giving the answers in advance of the questions 
This explained a lot for me, this overdetermining of a model of possible futures, how these systems get painted as objective while replicating violent hier hierarchies, and the logic underlying how we organize society and why our piecemeal reforms are always already set up to fail. It also helped explain why we keep locking people up and increasing police funding when research has known for a while that locking people up doesn't reduce crime and increasing policing actually makes society more violent. It's about this, how these algorithms seem inevitable and justify keeping these power relations intact. The idea that those on the leading edge of the bell curve are naturally supposed to be there to educate, reform, and control those in the middle. Movements trying to make nicer, professional, more educated police forces or kinder processes of criminal reform might try to flatten this curve or shift it one direction or another, making an obsession out of the illusion of progress, but they don't do a thing to change the way it's set up. So many of our conversations about policing then and now produce this binary dichotomy, good cop or bad apple, productive citizen or criminal. And this does a lot. It individualizes the issue. It deflects any systemic analysis. It buries the histories that produce these systems. It hides discussion over what is the actual purpose of policing. And it hides conversations about what frames someone as law-abiding or productive. Producing what? Contributing to what system? Or, if someone's criminalized, how is this predetermined? and not actually related at all to following laws or not. As far as the logic of the system goes, the criminal becomes hereditary, racialized, queer, abnormal, deviant, by definition. This always brings me to questions of reform or abolition. They were trying to reform the system a hundred years ago, having some of the same conversations we're having now. But you can't move pieces of a system around if this is what you have to work with. You can't be eternally trying to tweak a system built on this kind of foundation. We take for granted that all we have to work with is a binary choice between a system of repression or these milquetoast incremental reforms that always just seem to get reabsorbed to make the exploitative and expropriative capacities of the system even stronger. After all, the prison abolition movement reminds us that abolition isn't just about defunding and dismantling the police or getting rid of cages. It's about undoing the society we live in that makes this criminalization, surveillance, extraction, and accumulation possible. It's about getting outside of this false choice, overdetermined at the source. And it's about creating different systems of accountability, care, and real safety. It's about refusing to let our futures be foreclosed and overdetermined. And it's about demanding something different.